Boston, 1962. On the verge of an encounter with one of the most feared and elusive serial killers in American history, the Boston Strangler. People said that it was as if Jack the Ripper had come back from the dead to stalk Boston. Twilight, June 14th, victim number one. The body of 55-year-old Anna Slessers was found with a sash tied around her neck. The knot so tight that blood was dripping from her ear. Her attacker sexually assaulted her with an unknown object, then left her half-naked, sprawled on the kitchen floor. Two weeks later, victim number two. 68-year-old Nina Nichols was found dead in her apartment. Two nylon stockings wound around her neck, blood dripping from both ears. She had been sexually violated with a bottle. The next week, victim number three was found in Lynn, just north of Boston. Helen Blake, who was 65, was lying on her bed wearing nothing but a pajama top, stained with blood. Two stockings and a bra were wrapped tightly around her neck, fashioned into a bow. She, too, had been sexually assaulted. Police suspected they had a single culprit on their hands. The similarity seemed to add up to the grisly signature of a deranged killer. Then, like clockwork, victim number four was found three weeks later back in Boston. This time, the killer posed the naked body of 75-year-old Ida Erga, with her legs spread wide, straddling two chairs, exposed to whoever opened the apartment door. Once again, the cause of death was strangulation. The Boston Strangler had now pulled off more than a string of murders. He had paralyzed a city with fear. News reports said a madman was on the loose. Within 24 hours of the last murder, another elderly woman's body was found with her head submerged in a tub of water. Victim number five, 67-year-old Jane Sullivan, had two stockings twisted around her neck. Then there was an eerie reprieve. For the next three months, there were no more stranglings, until December 5th, 1962. Victim number six, Sophie Clark was found gagged and strangled in her apartment near Boston University. Her roommate discovered the body. She just didn't move, and I was really panicked and shocked, and I called out her name, and I said, oh, God. And I just stood there for about a second. I thought, well, what was I going to tell her mother? They thought they had a serial killer up until the Sophie Clark murder. At that point, they had to stop and think uh, whether it could be the same individual, uh, because certain things were different. All of the other victims were older and white. Sophie was young, and she was black. At this point, sheer panic enveloped Boston. No woman was safe. Old, young, black, white, anyone could be a target. Boston's Phantom Strangler was grabbing headlines fast. Newspapers churned out fear with each edition, and people looked for any way to protect themselves. Every morning, the pound would be empty because the dogs would have been seized by citizens. There had been a tremendous demand for animals of all sizes, both large and small, since the strangulation began. There was a run on locks. After each one of these stranglings, we get quite a spurt for all types of locks, mainly these chain locks. Avon salesmen and fuller brushmen were brusquely driven away. The whole town was locked up. But all the security precautions failed to prevent another murder. By the end of 1962, the strangler claimed his seventh victim. Patricia Bissett, just 23 years old, was found strangled on New Year's Eve. At this point, police were baffled. At each crime scene, there was no sign of forced entry, no robbery, no apparent motive. We don't feel that the person or persons responsible for one or more of these crimes is necessarily 100% psychotic. We feel that the person may be normal in many ways. We feel that they will tell someone about it. We would like to hear from that person or persons before harm comes to someone else. But harm did come. During the next year, three more women died at the hands of the strangler, including 23-year-old Joanne Graff, raped, then strangled. The same day, America mourned the death of President Kennedy. But the most vicious crime of all was yet to come. Victim number 11, Mary Sullivan, just shy of her 20th birthday, was found in her Boston apartment on January 4th, 1964. The killer had strangled her and shoved a broom handle inside her. Propped against her foot was a greeting card proclaiming Happy New Year. Then, just as mysteriously as they started, the murder stopped. The police had exhausted every lead, but had no concrete evidence. So, the state of Massachusetts created the Strangler Bureau, a multi-agency task force with one goal in mind, find the Strangler. This office is concerned. The Attorney General, Edward Brooke, was under 
a lot of pressure to step in and correlate the various investigations in Greater Boston. As far as I'm concerned, it was one of the most extensive searches and uh, investigations that we ever had. Since uh, June 1962, we've interrogated or interviewed over 5,000 people. We've screened over 2,500 uh, sex offenders who have been released from mental hospitals and jails and institutions. But the cops had little to go on. So we had well over 1,000 leads in our files, but no one suspect would apply to all of the stranglers we were looking at. The police never did find the Boston Strangler. Instead, the Strangler found the police. Almost a year after the last killing, a man set forward and claimed that he was the one. He was the Boston Strangler. His name? Albert Henry DeSalvo. It was March 1965, when America could finally put a face to the monster known as the Boston Strangler. A 33-year-old construction worker named Albert DeSalvo had confessed to the 18-month killing spree. At the time, he was awaiting trial for a series of rapes. Boston police believed Albert was their man. His confessions included remarkably accurate details, especially when it came to the last victim, Mary Sullivan. I have been on the side of the bed with a head hanging down, and a bunch of exposed, and was she lying flat on her back, or was she... No, she was sitting up. I spent time in, in uh, all the Boston cases and most of the outside cases, and his description is better than what I could give at that time. Police and reporters began unraveling the troubled life of Albert DeSalvo. It had begun during the Great Depression in Chelsea, the poorest town in all of Massachusetts. Albert DeSalvo was born in Chelsea in September of 1931. He was the third of six children of Charlotte and Frank DeSalvo. His childhood was miserable. Frank was a monster of abuse to his wife and to his children. He once broke Charlotte's fingers by serially snapping them as if they were dry twigs. Frank DeSalvo would bring home prostitutes and have intercourse with them in front of the children. Well, one of the things that stands up would be uh, probably when I was four or five years old is my mother and my uh, father having a fight. And at some point, my mother got knocked down and my father had Albert by the neck picked him literally off, off the floor and was just shaking him like a rag doll. Soon after that incident, Charlotte and Frank divorced. The family never saw Frank again. By the time Albert was 12, he was working odd jobs after school. He delivered flowers and shine shoes to make some pocket money. Most of all, he tried to make life easier on his sisters and brothers. If we were sitting there, he'd say, you want a Coke? And then he'd know, you know, looking at me, he'd, say, he'd know right away, a Coke isn't enough. You want, you want a sandwich, a hot dog, you want a cake? Before he was 13, Albert had a police record. Albert had his first brush with the law in 1943. He committed assault and battery and robbery on a neighborhood paper boy. The take from that was $2.85. The judge gave Albert a suspended sentence. Within weeks, he was arrested again for breaking and entering. He had stolen $24 worth of jewelry from a neighborhood house. This time, there was no slap on the wrist. Albert was thrown into a reform school the Lyman School for Boys, where he spent a total of two years. It was a harsh and forbidding world, but even after he was let out, Albert's home environment wasn't much saner than reform school had been. Just as in his early childhood, 14-year-old Albert was graphically exposed to sexual promiscuity. This time, it was his neighbors in the apartment building on Chelsea's Lower East Side. Albert also complained, he says, uh, they had a couch on the roof, and the people living in this building would have girls there. And I'd come up and they'd say, here's a quarter, beat it. And uh, he says, sex all the time, happening all the time. The otherwise meek and impressionable teenager was beginning to show a sadistic side as well. Albert himself would, would put dogs and cats in orange crates and let them scratch each other to death. But Albert did not show any violence to those closest to him. We had a little spat because uh, I wanted to go with him somewhere and he kept you know, denying me from going and finally I grabbed him by the hair and I wouldn't let go. I pulled out a, a piece of the scalp and all on it. And even at that point, uh, he still, you know, he just took it like a grain of salt. He, uh, he, he was angry, but, but not enough to hit me or, or anything for it. Albert's home life was not improving. So at the age of 17, with only a junior high school diploma, Albert found a way out. He joined the army. There he developed a reputation for being obsessively neat. Albert completed his basic training at Fort Dix in New Jersey and was transferred to Germany in 1949. There, 
at a USO event, he met a woman named Ermgard Beck. They fell in love. Albert was passionately in love with Ermgard. He adored her, and he treated her as if she were a goddess. Albert and Ermgard were quickly married in the small town of Bad Kissingen, but the marriage ran into problems right away. Ermgard discovered that Albert had an abiding obsession with sex and an overpowering sex drive that he relieved by masturbating frequently. She was said to have claimed that he wanted to make love six, five or six times a day, which clearly she did not have the time for, nor the inclination. The only thing she ever said to me is that they did have sex, and then when she goes to the bathroom, she'd find a dish towel or another towel with semen or something on it, and that upset her. Why, what's wrong with him that he should have sex with me and then have to go to, into the bathroom? He said, I have a burning feeling in my abdomen, flashes of burning, and it means I have to have re sexual release of some kind. In 1954, the young couple left Germany for America, where Albert's sexual problems soon caught up with him. When Albert returned to the United States, to New Jersey, he had brushes with the law. The most serious one was an arrest in Mount Holly, New Jersey in January of 1955 for carnal abuse of a child. The charges were dropped when the girl's mother decided the court proceedings would be too traumatic for the child. Albert decided it was a good time to leave town. In 1956, Albert, Ermgard, and their new baby daughter packed up and left New Jersey and the army altogether. Their destination, Boston. Within years, Albert would begin his downward spiral into a psychotic world of sexual deviation and violence. At the age of 25, Albert DeSalvo was fighting an internal battle against his own monstrous sexual cravings, and he was losing. But he still strained to live the normal working class life in Boston with his wife Ermgard and their baby girl. He was very firm about the fact that he was a devoted husband and father. He never went out with the guys for a beer after work. He came straight home. He gave his entire pay packet to Ermgard. He was never one for a night out on the town. Albert grabbed whatever job he could find in a shoe factory, then in a shipyard, and finally as a construction worker. By 1960, Albert and Ermgard had their second child, a son. But Albert was restless. He wanted to be something in life and uh, just didn't have the background, training, education, experience, or the wherewithal to become anyone except a loudmouth, self-centered, egotistical braggart. And a sexual predator. Albert had begun to prowl the streets of Cambridge searching for his prey. He invented a routine to con gullible young women, relying heavily on his ability to charm. A man claiming to be a representative of a black and white modeling agency, he called himself Johnson, was appearing at the doors of various young women and saying, you're lovely, uh, you should be a model, may I take your measurements? That man was Albert DeSalvo. He would then say that he was empowered to take their measurements to see if they would fit the photographer's needs, and that he was allowed to give $10 for just their measurements, or $15 in brown pants, or $25 in the nude. A surprising number of women went along with Albert's scheme. It was not uncommon for Albert to then talk his way into bed with the most trusting of his prey. But some of the women complained to the police. The cops started keeping a watch out for the con artist they called the measuring man. Meanwhile, Albert was branching out he was fast becoming an expert at breaking and entering. And luck was on his side. Although he was arrested and charged with burglary several times, he always received a suspended sentence and walked out of court. Until March 17th, 1961. That night, Albert was caught while burglarizing a house on Broadway in Cambridge. DeSalvo had every reason to once again expect easy treatment at the hands of the law. But this time, he himself changed the rules. On the way back to the station house, Albert boasted to the police about his many sexual conquests, explaining in detail the unusual scheme he'd cooked up to con women as the measuring man. The police were delighted with Albert's unsolicited confession. They arrested him for the measuring man assaults, and they threw the book at him charging him with breaking and entering, assault and battery, and lewdness. But the judge softened the blow. He dropped the charge of lewdness and allowed DeSalvo to plead guilty only to the burglary and assault charges, an act of leniency that would have serious consequences later. To Albert, it didn't seem lenient at all. For the first time in his life, Albert had to go to prison, the Bilricka House of Corrections. His sentence was just 11 months. In April 1962, 
Albert was once again a free man. It was two months later that the first victim of the Boston Strangler, Anna Slessers, was found dead. For the next 18 months, the Strangler's string of grisly murders terrorized Boston and the whole nation. But the police never suspected Albert DeSalvo. Because the judge had not charged him with sexual offenses for the measuring man crimes, Albert's name did not come up when the Strangler Task Force combed the police files for suspects. In fact, DeSalvo might never have been connected to the Boston Stranglings at all if it hadn't been for his insatiable sexual appetite. In May of 1964, five months after the last known Boston Strangling, Albert began a series of rapes in Massachusetts. These crimes would earn him yet another nickname, the Green Man. The Green Man scheme was somewhat, well, considerably different from his measuring man gig. He got the name Green Man from the fact that he wore a workman's uniform. He would drive somewhere and the urge would be on him. That's the only way he explained it. And he would park wherever there's a place to park. Then he would go in the building and he would look at the bells. And if there's a name of a woman, he would simply press the bell. He would say, there's a leak, or the superintendent uh, has sent me around to turn off your water so that we can check out the leak in the basement. And of course, there would be no leak, but the woman would admit him to the house. He would then bind her and sexually assault her. I don't think it made any difference to Albert who answered. Some were old, some were young. I think his criteria was that a woman answered when he rang the bell. Sometimes he would apologize to his victims. When he would tie them up, he would spread eagle them on a bed, and then he'd kiss them about the body and then do other things. Four victims of the Green Man went to the police. And even though DeSalvo was not recorded as a sex offender, one cop with a good memory remembered that as the measuring man, Albert had been accused of sex crimes. The police told Albert to come in for questioning. Instead, Albert fled to his brother's house. He says, I'm going to be arrested. I says, well, what? What did you do? And he says, I've done some things. I says, what did you do? And he just started to cry. It was then that Albert made a startling confession to his sister-in-law about a break-in gone bad. He says, I did harm to somebody. I says, what are you talking about? He says, I'm responsible for your woman dying. I says, what a woman? What are you talking about? He says, I broke in the house, he says, and I scared the woman. She died of a heart attack. The woman Albert was referring to was 85-year-old Mary Mullen. She had indeed been found dead of a heart attack in her home, but there had been no evidence of foul play, and Mullen's death was never considered a homicide. Now, Albert brought his brother Richard and Richard's family home with him. When they arrived at Albert's house, the police were already there waiting. Something's going down. I says, you know, how come everybody's all of a sudden look at your car? So he says, well, I think this is it. I think they're going to arrest me. Then he started picking up speed. He ended up driving on the wrong side of the street, half on the street, half on the sidewalk. He was hitting uh, no parking signs, stuff like that there. My husband says, you know, you can't do this. Cops are everywhere. So that's when he pulled over. He says, you stay here. And he got out and he started running. The chase continued on foot, but Albert's politeness kicked in. When one of the cops dropped his gun, Albert stopped running, found it, and handed it back to the officer. The cop showed his appreciation by cuffing him. When questioned by police, Albert confessed to several of the Green Man rapes. The judge in the case found the confessions disturbing enough that he sent Albert to a mental hospital for observation. There, Albert would meet another mental patient named George Nasser. As usual, Albert could not help bragging about his exploits. He was constantly talking about what his crimes were. While talking to George Nasser, Albert would confess for the first time that he was the Boston Strangler. Albert DeSalvo began the fall of 1964 at the Bridgewater State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. He had been arrested for a series of rapes in Cambridge called the Green Man Crimes. The judge had sent him to the hospital to determine if Albert was competent to stand trial. As far as the psychiatrists were concerned, he was. I diagnosed Albert as a sociopath. A major characteristic was he was manipulative, not above committing crimes to get what he wanted. But there were also aspects, he was terribly insecure. He wanted to be the most important person in the world. Declared competent, Albert was sent back to jail, but not for long. In jail, Albert announced he was having visions of his wife appearing and berating him for his crimes. So the judge promptly sent Albert back to the mental hospital. This time, the psychiatrist decided to label him incompetent. Then suddenly, Albert started talking like he never had before. He bragged so much nobody believed him. As a matter of fact, he was found out only because he bragged to a cellmate, George Nasser, who was very bright. Nasser, who was in the mental hospital awaiting trial for murder, became Albert's confidant. 
You just want to know what could a person do to help himself and his family if he had a series of terrible crimes to confess to and didn't want to be simply buried in the system but wanted treatment for his crimes and wanted help for his family. According to Nasser, the terrible crimes Albert was hinting at were the Boston Stranglings. Nasser told Albert he would mention the problem to his own attorney, the famous young defense lawyer F. Lee Bailey. Bailey was intrigued by Albert's veiled admissions, but jailhouse confessions to unsolved crimes are quite common and often invented. So Bailey wanted some proof that Albert was telling the truth. To see if DeSalvo knew what only the killer could know, and no one could memorize if the real killer had told it. Bailey went to the Boston police and asked for detailed questions on the Stranglings, questions he could use to quiz Albert. We gave him probably 25 questions that, as far as we knew, were pretty much just secret in our organization. They certainly were never printed in the newspapers or, or was uh, on uh, television. When Bailey arrived at the mental hospital with the list of Strangler questions for Albert, George Nasser was present as the meeting started. Bailey then pulled open a folder and asked Al a question. It was something like, what was under the sofa of Mrs. So-and-so's apartment? And Al said something like, it was a pink and blue scarf, silk scarf. And that's when I said, I'll say, Al, I'm leaving. Bailey checked Albert's answers with the Boston police, who told him Albert had passed the test with flying colors. Now Bailey was sure he was dealing with the real Boston Strangler. He called Albert's wife, Ermgard, and told her. Ermgard packed up their belongings and left with the children. Albert never saw his family again. But when his brother Richard came to visit him, Albert told Richard he had great plans for the future. The way he explained it was he was going to admit to something. It was going to make him famous and rich. He would be able to have books and movies and so many different things. And, and there would be so much money involved that he would even own the hospital, the mental hospital that he'd be in. F. Lee Bailey signed on as Albert's lawyer. His top priority from that point on was to keep his client out of the electric chair. So Bailey cut a deal with the authorities. Albert would confess only if the court ruled him insane from the very start. But word was getting around that someone was confessing to the Boston Stranglings. State Attorney General Edward Brook decided to take control. I filed a petition in the Supreme Judicial Court asking for a restraining order against F. Lee Bailey. Brook had the court appoint Albert a legal guardian. Bailey was allowed to stay on as Albert's attorney, and the state agreed that in exchange for the confessions, Albert's words could not be used against him. All his admissions were given under guardianship, therefore they were absolutely inadmissible in a criminal case without a waiver on his part. The police planned to corroborate the confessions with physical evidence and then prosecute Albert. The interrogation of Albert DeSalvo was now ready to begin. Albert described the murder of Nina Nichols, victim number two, as he pointed to a diagram of her apartment. Then Albert claimed his sexual urges overwhelmed him. To lure his youngest strangling victim, Mary Sullivan, Albert explained that he used his green man ploy. The next grim detail Albert described was one that only Sullivan's killer could have known. In all, Albert claimed he killed 13 women, two more than the police suspected. But after hours of talking with him, all the authorities had was talk. They couldn't link any physical evidence to Albert. 
That was not for lack of trying. There were no witnesses. Fingerprints from the scenes did not match Albert. Nothing connected him to the crimes except his word. He knew a lot of details that had not been in print. So we felt that if he were not the Boston Strangler, he either knew the Strangler or had been with the Strangler. The people of Boston wanted to believe that the Strangler had been discovered at last. But there were skeptics. The Strangler story had been front page news for nearly two solid years. Albert could surely have studied the crimes from the news coverage. It is very interesting to me that Albert's confession reproduces the misinformation that appeared in the newspapers. For example, he grossly mistook the time of day that one of the murders was committed. Uh, he was mistaken about the type of weapon in another case. The police had agreed not to use DeSalvo's confessions as evidence against him, and they'd been unable to corroborate Albert's admissions with physical evidence. That meant that Albert was never actually charged with the Boston Stranglings and never stood trial for them. Instead, he was tried only for rapes. He committed as the Green Man. Of course, considering his confessions, most people, including journalists, consider the Strangler mystery solved. To this day, everyone who read those papers believed that Albert DeSalvo was a Boston Strangler. Defending Albert on the Green Man charges, Bailey tried from the outset to convince the jury, all of whom had heard of Albert's confessions to the Boston Stranglings, that Albert was insane. I hope that they recognize insanity because I think it will promote uh, some interest in finding out why he is the way he is. The prosecution said Albert knew right from wrong. He would tie the women up, he would touch them in the, in, on their breasts, in their private parts. He was able to carry on a conversation. He was not ranting or raving or incomprehensible as he spoke to the many victims. We use that as a sign that he was sane and that he knew he was committing criminal acts. The trial lasted eight days. The jury took four hours to reach its verdict, guilty but not insane. I felt that we had given them a common sense, logical case, and I am pleased that they saw it our way, sir. Albert was convicted on all charges. The judge sentenced DeSalvo to life in prison. Albert DeSalvo had never been formally charged with killing any of the victims of the Boston Strangler. Technically, all the cases remained open. But as far as the relieved nation was concerned, the Boston Strangler was at last behind bars. But Albert had other plans. Convicted of a series of rapes, Albert DeSalvo had been sentenced to life in prison. He had confessed to being the Boston Strangler, but would never stand trial for those crimes. In January 1967, he was returned to the mental hospital, awaiting transport to prison. A month later, he connived with two other patients to break out. Insofar so far as we know, one of them, at least, must have had either a key or some type of metal artifact whereby he was able to put his arm out of what is known as the peephole in the door. The three escapees jumped down an elevator shaft under construction and scaled a brick wall. In Boston, they split up. Midnight, February 23rd, 1967. Albert DeSalvo was on the loose. Once again, fear gripped Boston. It was a repetition of what they had gone through when he was running around loose killing people. Believe me when I tell you, the population of Greater Boston is two million. Let's say a million were women. A million women were in panic in Greater Boston at that time. One newspaper offered a $5,000 reward for Albert's capture. DeSalvo's lawyer, Effrey Bailey, said he would double that amount if Albert was captured unharmed. Police, heavily armed and carrying tear gas guns, combed the state. The hysteria was incredible. It was front page headlines in all of the newspapers. Newspaper articles appeared warning women what to do and what not to do. Albert, meanwhile, decided to pay a visit to his younger brother. I was kind of happy to hear his voice calling me from downstairs, ring the bell and says, hey, it's your brother Al down here, but surprised at the same time, because you know, even though I, I knew at some point he, w he would escape, I just didn't know when. Richard agreed to help Albert. He gave him civilian clothes and a gun. Now, armed and dangerous, Albert made it out of Boston and headed north to the city of Lynn, where police were on the alert. The captain grabbed me, and he says, we have information that the salvo's in Lynn. And I saw wonderful, that's all we need today. It was 36 hours after Albert had escaped. After walking around undetected for a few hours, dressed in an old Navy uniform he had found, Albert stopped at a shoe store and asked to use the phone. He said he needed, quote, to call F. Lee. And as soon as he said that, we all turned and realized that that was DeSalvo. And while he was calling Bailey, we called the wind police and told them he's here. While we were waiting for the police, uh, I don't know why, but I asked him, uh, did you strangle all those 13 women? And he responded, I think I got the words exactly as he responded, I honestly don't know, I know I did some of them. Within minutes, the police converged on the shoe store. And we dashed into Simon's, 
He was standing in the rear of the store, and I recognized him from the picture. And I asked him his name. He said it was DeSalvo, and I put the cuffs on him. Did he give you a hard time? No, he didn't. Did he say anything to you? He said he was DeSalvo. As the different police agencies fought over the privilege of returning Albert to jail, DeSalvo was paraded before the swarm of reporters. Yeah, well, you don't have to know, but my name's perfectly leaving. Yeah, I'll you know, Albert, yeah. Albert, yeah. Albert, yeah. Albert, I promise. I did. I didn't want to know, buddy. After the fact, Albert DeSalvo insisted that his escape was meant to protest his being sentenced to a prison instead of a mental institution. Albert has had a single-minded and <clears throat> often articulated desire ever since he got in the place, and he initially retained me for the purpose of getting him to an institution where there were doctors. It was that simple. After his capture, Albert was promptly shipped to the place he had tried desperately to avoid, Massachusetts' toughest penitentiary, Walpole. There, he was reunited with George Nasser, who was serving a life term for murder. The two hatched a deal they hoped would bring them money and fame. My agreement with Al was simply this. If you promise me that you will confess to the crimes, not lie, confess to the crimes that you say you committed, and you will follow through with the program of psychiatric treatment and of assisting your family and of publishing a book concerning your crimes and concerning your treatment, I'll help you. It's a contract. Nasser began helping DeSalvo draft his book, and he rarely left Albert's side. Nasser was always there. And even though we asked him a couple of times, what does he have to be here? I mean, this is family, you know? He says, well, he's only going to rise us as he's sitting there doing nothing. Albert decided to cash in on his infamy with a sideline business. In the prison crafts room, he began assembling women's jewelry. His specialty was chokers. But Albert also had serious problems to face. He was a walking target for the other inmates. They were all going to get him, you know. Could have been my sister, could have been my mother, could have been this. They all want to be heroes. I can get the boss to strangle and I can go up another couple of notches. They would affect the vengeance that the society felt was his due. They were saying, hey, you killed 13 women, some of whom were mothers, and you're going around bragging about it and finding that funny and talking about making chokers for women and laughing and giggling about this. It wasn't long before prison life took its toll on Albert. Within a few months, he looked as though he had aged years. He was worn out, absolutely worn out. He wasn't a guy to do time. Six years later, on November 22nd, 1973, Albert was stabbed to death in prison. He was 42 years old. Twelve hours before his murder, he had made a phone call to one of his old psychiatrists. He said that he wanted to meet with me to tell the real story of the Boston Strangler. We were going to meet him at 9 a.m. Monday morning. He was killed at 2 a.m. that morning. My belief was that he was going to say how he, how he got into this here, that he wasn't the Boston Strangler, who put him after it, and name names. That was one theory. There were others. Albert was selling speed in the prison, and he was selling it at less than the syndicate price, and he'd been warned, don't do that, and uh, Albert didn't take orders from anybody, and this time they killed him. He was killed over two pounds of institution bacon. He was supposed to give a pound to someone else and didn't. The case of Albert DeSalvo's murder remains open. And so did the Boston Stranglings. Despite widespread public certainty that DeSalvo was the Strangler, some of those familiar with the case have lingering questions. Everyone wanted the Boston Strangler out the street. And if someone wanted to confess to it at that time and could give any reasons why he was, I think we were ready to willing to accept it. He wanted to be world-renowned. And of course, if you confess to the worst serial murder since Jack the Ripper, you're going to be famous, infamous. Another reason that he had was that someone convinced him that if he confessed to being the Boston Strangler, he could make it a lot of money. As far as the investigators are concerned, there is no mystery. Albert DeSalvo was the Boston Strangler. I've been asked many, many times over the years if I really thought that Albert DeSalvo was the Strangler. And I was positive 30 years ago, and I'm positive now. Albert DeSalvo never published the book that he thought would make him a rich man. But shortly before his death, he did write a poem and gave it to his lawyer, Tom Troy. Here's a story, The Strangler, yet untold. The man who claims he strangled 13 women, young and old. He struck within the light of day, leaving not one clue astray. To reveal the secret will bring him fame that burden his family with unwanted shame. Today he sits in a prison cell, deep inside, only a secret he can tell. People everywhere are still in doubt. Is the strangler in prison or roaming about?